Good morning, everybody, and welcome to video number two in series number two of our GMAT Club GMAT videos. Uh, for those who haven't watched one of these before, my name is Charles Bibelos. I'm a tutor at GMATNinja.com and also GMAT Club's resident verbal expert. Uh, and this is going to be the first time in these videos you're going to see me try to do some math, uh, which I really do in real life, not usually on GMAT Club. Fantastic guy named Bunuel who uh, presides over the Quant Forum. Amazing. Follow that guy. So what's today all about? So if you were with us last week on Valentine's Day for our very, very sexy broadcast about how to tutor yourself in the GMAT, one of the biggest things we focused on was this idea that improving at the GMAT is so much harder than some people want to tell you, and certainly a lot harder than any of us want it to be. Statistically, GMAT tells us that the average person who retakes the exam improves by about 30 points, and most of those gains come from people who started at a really low level, so below a 500. Statistically, if you're starting above a 500, odds are not good that you will improve. Now, today what I want to talk about a little bit is why that happens. What's the biggest reason why? So hopefully a lot of you who are already familiar with GMAT Club have spent time on the shared GMAT experience section of the forum. And where people's eyes tend to go when they go to that part of the forum is they see that great story where, where somebody says, oh, I got a 780 in six weeks of studying, or I improved from 650 to 750 in three weeks, or something like that. I mean, you, you want to read those tales of glory. Now, the, the actual reality of what happens, I actually follow that part of the forum really, really carefully. Um, there are those stories. They're fantastic. You sometimes see people improve by 300 points. It might take them years. Those stories are amazing, amazing, amazing. We linked to some of them in, in last week's uh, broadcast. But what we actually see the most of is people who say, yeah, my practice tests were, were a 700, but I got a, I got a 580. What happened? Or I got a 650 on my last practice test, but then I walked in and I got a 500. What, what happened? So we tend to see all of these anguished, oh my god, I can't improve. What's happening? Or worse still, my practice tests were really, really good, but then my actual test wasn't so good. Ah, what happened? So today's webinar is mostly about that. What's the biggest reason why people's scores fall? And the biggest reason why is cutting corners. So what we're going to try to do today is we're going to walk through at least little pieces of all five question types, time permitting, at least discuss them briefly. We'll focus mostly on quant in the beginning. Time permitting, we'll get to some verbal in the end. And basically, we're going to talk about what does cutting corners mean on these different question types and how exactly does that destroy your score. And I can't emphasize enough, this is the most important thing on the GMAT period. If you know how to do something, you better get it right. And it's not sexy. People hire us as tutors or people come study on their own or people join us on GMAT Club and ask questions. And the focus tends to be, hey, I want to get better at the hard stuff. I want to get better at the hard stuff. Cool. Good. Get better at everything. Really good for you. But if you don't handle the easy stuff on an adaptive test, you'll never even see the hard stuff. So we'll talk more about that in a few minutes, how the algorithm works a little bit, how the test works. But first, um, let me get your brains warmed up a little bit on the math. So I'm going to give you a quick little five question, little practice set. Um, these are all really easy questions for the most part mathematically. I think most of you, especially since um, a lot of you know me as the, the verbal expert, so you guys tend to be pretty good in quant, um, this won't be hard for most of you. So I'm going to give you two and a half minutes on the button. Go ahead and take a look at this. We'll give you two and a half minutes for five questions. Should be about right. And uh, yeah, good luck to y'all.
and down your last 15 seconds. All right, pencils down, time's up. Um, so Shovik, if you could please go in advance to that next slide. Um, and if you could, let me know how folks are doing. If, if uh, people have been given answers, I'm curious to see what the results are looking like. Okay, so before we jump back into these questions and kind of talk through what went right, what went wrong, what could go wrong if you're running through them a little bit too quickly, let's talk about kind of how the adaptive algorithm works. I know that pretty much all of you, if you're watching this, if you somehow found us, odds are pretty good, you know the basics of how an adaptive algorithm works. So the idea is that the, the test is looking for the rough level of question at which you get half right and half wrong. It ends up in practice being about 40%. Um, so what's the test doing? So you get a, a question right, it's going to give you a somewhat harder one. If you get a, a, get a question wrong, you're going to get an easier one. Simple enough in theory, right? Now in practice, what ends up happening is that every question is going to be selected based on your entire performance up to that point. Um, so here's the thing. Let's suppose that, that you are a really, really high flyer. You're, gonna, you're somebody who's destined to score in the top 10% on the GMAT in terms of just where your skills are. So there were actually a couple of folks, a couple of academics. They did a, a simulation study back in 2009. And they said, well, all right, wait a minute. So if we take a test that runs the exact same algorithm, it's a thing called the three-parameter logistic model. If you're having a hard time sleeping tonight, give me a call. I'll tell you all about the three-parameter logistic model. You'll fall right asleep. That's the statistical guts underneath the GMAT and many other standardized tests, especially computer adaptive tests. So they basically said, hey, we're going to simulate a test that uses the same, the same statistical guts, the same algorithm, um, the same statistical model. And we're going to say, all right, you know, we can kind of simulate test taker behavior, um, and but we're going to change one thing. We're going to take those people who would normally score in the top 10%, and they're going to behave like normal on a 30-question exam, except that they're going to miss the first two questions when they normally would not. Um, and by the way, the GMAT, the quant section, you get about 28 scored questions, 37 questions total. About nine of those are experimental. Verbal section, 41 questions. About 11 of those are experimental. So it turns out that even though this study was done kind of generically for a test that was like the GMAT, it actually turns out that when they do the simulations with 30 questions, it actually is very, very, very similar to the way the GMAT behaves. So if you miss the first two questions and then after that you behave like normal and you're a top 10% kind of test taker, what happens? Your score declines by an equivalent of about uh, but between 0.56 and 0.71 standard deviations. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, on the GMAT, it has a standard deviation of 120 points. So if you miss those first two questions when normally you would not, in other words, you miss two questions that are easy for you right at the beginning, you're going to lose about 70 to 80 points on your test. Um, now, that's kind of abstracting from the difference between quant and verbal. On the quant section, if you miss the first two and normally you would not, and normally you're a super high score, you're going to lose between six and eight points, verbal between five and six points. That is a huge, huge gap. So on quant, that's the difference between getting something like a 48, um, which would make a lot of you happy, and getting something that's in the low, low 40s. Totally different animal. Verbal, same idea. For a lot of you, your goal is something like a 40. This puts you squarely in the mid 30s. Not going to walk away happy. So it actually is a feature of the test. We can debate whether it's an accident, whether this is something the GMAT wants to have happen, but it's a reality. If you miss easy questions, easy questions for you, things that you can normally handle, but for some reason on the test you didn't, it's going to drop your score really, really quickly. This is the single biggest reason why we see those, those disappointments, why we see those poor folks in the shared GMAT experience section saying, uh, I, I was scoring 720 in my practice test. I walked in, I got a 640. Yeah, I hate everybody. This is the biggest reason why a couple of brain farts, a couple of slip ups on things that are easy for you can cause all the trouble in the world. Now, notice this isn't saying that um, you can't miss stuff. You're going to miss a lot on the quant. You may well miss 40% of the questions and still get a really good score. The thing is you can miss all the hard ones you want to. You just can't miss the easy ones. So back to these questions, and I don't think we gave you quite enough time um, to get through those, but I just want to kind of illustrate what, what happens on a lot of these guys, because these are all questions that are, um, you know, things that we use for our students a fair amount of the time. Um, so that first question, so Diana received 45% of the votes cast in a certain election. What fraction of the other votes cast would you need in order to achieve 50%? Easy, right? This is just 5%. So that's 1 20th. 
if you chose 1 20th, uh, that's a problem because the question was asking you what fraction of the other votes would you have needed? What does Diana actually need here? Diana needs 5% of the other votes. She got 45% of the vote. 55% are equal to the other votes. She needs 5% of the 55%. She needs 1 11th. Um, and for the, the folks who are watching us live, feel free to post your answers as we go here, because I'm actually curious to see uh, see how you're doing. Um, so really, really easy mistake to make. You missed that word other, you're in trouble. Second one, nice, easy data sufficiency. We just want to know is R bigger than S. Obviously, if R is equal to three times S, you triple a number. So you take S, you triple it. R must be bigger, right? So A must be good. That must be sufficient. Oops. Second one, yeah, same idea. You take S, subtract something from it. You get R. That must mean S is bigger. Your answer is D. No, it's not. Why not? Were you thinking about negatives on statement number one? Sure, R is bigger than S if S is positive. R is going to be less than S here if it turns out that S is negative. So your answer here is actually B, not D. And just that little bit of haste, if you just kind of look at that and go, ah, that was easy, I got this, you're going to walk right into my trap. Third one, similar idea here. So Bruce, Bruce's sales, so he made uh, his sales were 200% greater than Chuck's and 300% of Darlene's. Darlene made $300, so what did what did Bruce sell? What I see a lot of people do here is they'll say, ah, 300, that's that's Darlene's. 300% uh, of Darlene's, we'll multiply that by three. Chuck, 200%, that's a two. We multiply all these guys together, we get 2,400. Nope, not quite, why not? We messed around with the language here. 300% of Darlene's, but 200% greater than Chuck's. Really, really, really easy to make that mistake. Now, most of you, if I if I sit here and I'm very specific about the language and you're not rushing through, you're not going to have any trouble at all. You're going to say, oh, 2% greater than Chuck's. That means you're multiplying it by 3, not 2. So what this should be is 300 times 3. 300% of, of always means multiply. 200% greater, you're multiplying by 3 there, 2,700. Um, and if you're not comfortable with what I'm saying about some of this language around percents. We're actually going to talk about that much more. We're going to do a webinar in a few weeks on uh, word translations on the GMAT. We'll talk more about some of this stuff around percents and how you can get twisted up in the language. For now, if you looked at this and you said, hey, 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 that's easy, and you made the mistake, this is for you. It's really easy to kind of rifle through and go, yep, 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 times two, times three, got it, 2,400. Um, I did that wrong. That's 1,800. That's embarrassing. Um, See, like I said, you rush through, you make careless errors. Um, so you get uh, 1,800, but in reality, if you're actually doing it really, really carefully and double checking that language, 200% greater than Chuck, 300% of Darlene, you end up with a different answer. Number four, uh, you might notice that I did something really sloppy and lazy here on purpose to illustrate the kind of thing that can go wrong. Um, what I wrote on my page is just, hey, what's the value of A? But there's actually more to the question of that. It says, if A is positive, what's the value of A? If you miss that part of it, you'll go, well, wait. A could be plus or minus a fifth. Same thing on statement two. And you could easily talk yourself into an answer of E just for missing that one little qualifier in the question. Answer, obviously, is D um, because we already know that A is positive that negative solutions are relevant to us. And similar idea number five is x, y, z odd. The, the quick, dirty, bad thing you could do here is go, hey, this doesn't tell me anything about y. That's not sufficient. This doesn't tell me anything about x and z. That's not sufficient. I need them both, right? Because now we have that x, z times y, odd times even, then we know for sure that it's even. Your answer is C, not correct again if you're going through too quickly. This is not sufficient indeed, because if y is even, the answer to this would be no. If y is odd, the answer will be yes. So that's not sufficient. This by itself is. As long as one of these is even, the whole thing is even. And we've answered the question. The answer is no. So this is just a quick, quick illustration. And again, this is geared towards those of you who are totally comfortable with the mathematics behind this. 
um, quick, quick illustration of what can happen if you're just moving too quickly. So what do we actually want you to do here? Like what's, what's the key? How do you become totally systematic, totally consistent? How do you avoid these kinds of errors? Here's what I want you to do. It's totally not sexy at all. Not what most people think they're getting when they're watching a, a GMAT webinar or taking a GMAT course or, or hiring a GMAT tutor. But I want you to do every single question, especially on problem solving, but the same is gonna be true on data sufficiency. And we'll talk more in a moment about some specific things in addition on data sufficiency. What I always want you to do on quant, read the question twice, not once, twice before you do absolutely anything. Why? You miss that little modifier, you're toast. And again, you miss two super easy questions right at the beginning of the test. That can cost you the equivalent of 70, 80 points, right? So read the question twice. Make sure that you're not missing some little detail of language. Second thing, as you go through, make sure you're double checking your steps. Notice what I did here. I got the wrong answer because I was sloppy. wasn't double checking. I was talking to you. Um, be really careful of that. Takes you no time at all just to go, wait a minute, let me make sure that three times three times two is not 24. Takes you no time at all, three seconds, six seconds. Everybody has moments where four times seven is 32. Doesn't matter who you are. I have those moments, obviously. The key is, are you taking the time to check those mistakes as you go through? Check and make sure. Make sure you're not dropping a negative. Make sure in something like this, you're thinking about negatives. You see a squared term, you should be on your toes for negatives. So third thing, I want you to read the question one more time before you move on. So three steps that you should always, always, always employ on every single quant question. Read the question twice before you do anything. Make sure you're not missing some little detail of language. Second, check every step, every little bit of algebra arithmetic as you go. Third, read one more time at the end. Why? Maybe if you'd checked one more time at the end, you wouldn't miss the difference between the of and the greater than. Maybe you wouldn't have missed the word positive here. Maybe you wouldn't have missed the word other in that first question. Absolutely critical. And one of the things we say to our students all the time, if you're 91% consistent about this stuff, you have a huge risk of walking out of the test disappointed. You're gonna be under more pressure. You're gonna be under more stress. You're gonna be watching the clock more closely. You're gonna maybe be a little bit nervous on test day. You're gonna make more mistakes than you normally do in practice. So what you absolutely have to do to guarantee that you're gonna get the score you really deserve on the GMAT is you've gotta make sure that you're systematic 100% of the time. Read the question twice, check your work as you go, double check for those mistakes. One more time at the end, make sure you're answering the right question, make sure you haven't missed some little detail of language. Absolutely critical, can't emphasize it enough. I know, not sexy, everybody wants to work on the hard stuff, do that too. But first, make sure you're not missing the easy stuff. Make sure that's 100% systematic all the time. And that will stop you from being one of those stories we look at on the shared GMAT experience section of the forum and go, ah, oh, that poor guy, ah, oh, that poor person, that just sounds miserable. Please take care of this right from the start. And we won't see you with that post. We'll see you with the good kind of post. All right, next thing. So I know what a lot of you are thinking right now is, uh, you know, hey, you, you really don't have time to do this kind of thing on the actual test. Um, the reality is you, you absolutely have to. Um, you're better off dealing with timing problems in some sense than ending up in a situation where you miss a bunch of easy questions. Absolutely critical. I'll show you in a moment, I'll show you somebody's uh, enhanced score reports and we'll talk about kind of what that can do to your score. Um, just as a quick preview of some of that, what you're always gonna wanna do, if a question's over your head, let it go. Look, you're going to miss about 40% on the quant section. Make sure that you're controlling the test. If there's a question that's over your head, don't spend time on it. Look at your, your practice test. And if you see a lot of questions that are taking three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, six minutes, that's time you're much better off spending on the things that are easy for you, being super, super, super careful. All right. So before we talk through one more score report, let's have you do a little bit of uh, data sufficiency. Now on the data sufficiency, I'm gonna have one extra thing to say about how to be really systematic and careful on these. Um, so here's three more questions and I'll give you guys, um, I'm gonna give you guys about, let's do about four minutes on these because I think a couple of them are pretty easy. Um, and if you could please, as you go through for the live audience, go ahead and tell us your answers as you go. So as you finish up number one, go ahead and spit your answer out at us because we're curious. Same thing on number two. If you don't make it all the way through number three, no worries at all. So I'll give you about four minutes for this set.
give you about 30 more seconds. And uh, again, please don't be shy. Post your answers as you go, because I'm curious to see if, uh, if we're seeing the kinds of mistakes that I'm worried about. About 30 more seconds. Okay, so, so thank you to all of you who are posting your responses, and I, I know I'm kind of rushing some of the rest of you through, so totally understand why you might be shy about it. A um, couple things. So, so again, theme of this, this webinar is about how to avoid cutting corners, how important it is not to cut corners on the GMAT. Data sufficiency, in, in my opinion, there's kind of two specific things beyond what we were just talking about on problem solving. So problem solving and on quant in general, read your question twice, check your work as you go, read one more time at the end. Absolutely critical, you miss one word. You can be in trouble. Data sufficiency, I'd add a couple things. Um, one is I think a lot of you probably already do some variation of this where you just want to make sure you're really methodical about keeping your statements separate. I want you to look at statement one without ever even thinking about statement two, ideally. Um, this is kind of a little widget popularized, I think, by Manhattan GMAT quite a few years ago. Um, other test prep companies do other things. We meet a lot of people who are already using this. so. So we tend to roll with that. That's the most common thing we see. Fine if you're using something else. The part I really care about is make sure you're being really disciplined. Keep your statements separate. As soon as you try to read both statements together, then all of a sudden it's really hard to unsee them. You've got to deal with A by itself. You've got to deal with B by itself. If you've already read both statements together, really, really, really tough to think about A without also thinking about B once you've already read it. So that's one part. Be really, really systematic with making sure you're using that process elimination really, really well, keeping your statements separate. You'll see me use this as we go through these three questions. Second thing, this is actually the more, um, I wouldn't say it's more important, but I think this is the thing that tends to get ignored more often in our world. Um, on a lot of data sufficiency questions on the GMAT, deliberate design feature, the more you work with the question itself before you move on into the answer choices, the easier it's gonna be. And what I mean by that is if there are ways for you to rewrite this question, two ways, three ways, six ways, the more work you can do with the question itself, with the information given to you in the question, not the answer choices, the better off you're gonna be. So in a case like this, it's really, really tempting to say, okay, so Fareed spent $420 on Doritos, tacos, and pizza. I get a little equation out of that, D plus T plus P equals 420. You wanna know T, okay, fine, great, let's go on. And you get statement one and it says, well, he spent, uh, so pizza plus Doritos equals 40% of what he spent on tacos. Well, I don't know, we've got two equations and three variables that really doesn't look solvable to me. So what I could do here, and I know some of you are like, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait. What I could do here, I'm not saying it's the right thing, what I could do here is I could say, well, wait, two equations, three variables, get rid of that. Second statement, the amount he spent on pizza was 25% of the amount he spent on tacos. Okay, one more equation. Uh, that doesn't really do anything for me. So not B. And now I get an answer of C because, hey, now I've got three equations, three variables. That's lazy thinking. And all of you who have responded so far know that that's not correct. What should you do first? What I'd ideally like to see you do is to say, well, what do I really want? What else is going to get me T? Well, if I want T, really what I want is 420 minus D minus P. And really put another way, if I get D plus P, I've got this. So now what that allows you to do is it makes it a heck of a lot easier to notice the value of statement one. D plus P equals 0.4 T. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This, this process of pushing the question, rewriting it as many ways as you can, working as much with the question itself as you can before you look at the answer choices, makes it so much more efficient. Now you recognize, hopefully in statement one, yeah, D plus P is a really useful thing. This is kind of what I want. I can substitute 0.4 T in for this D plus P over here. And now I just get 1.4 T equals 420. Very, very much solvable and you can get rid of BCE. 
And then obviously that second statement isn't going to be sufficient, doesn't allow you to eliminate that D at all. So where you save a whole bunch of time, save the opportunity for an error on this one, push the question. The more work you do, just a couple extra lines of algebra really, really can save you time, really can save you the opportunity to make an error. Same idea on the second one. So if I want to know if this thing is positive, what do I really want to know? Well, I don't care about B that has an even exponent on it. What do I really want to know? I really want to know is A to the fifth times C to the seventh greater than zero. Yeah, but that five and that seven, that just kind of complicates things, right? So you know that A to the fifth is going to be positive if A is positive and negative if A is negative. So I could translate this totally equivalent to ask is a times c greater than zero? Great, simple, simple thing, takes no time at all. Rewrite the question a couple ways. These are all totally logically equivalent to that original question. They just look different, a little bit simpler, a little bit cleaner. And so what happens? Well, that first statement, obviously not sufficient, tells you nothing about a c. This gives you exactly what you were looking for. Your answer is b. Quick and easy, somebody who's rushing through, not spending that time, might make the mistake to say, wow, this doesn't tell me about AC, this doesn't tell me about B, I need them both, the answer is C. You can fall into that trap really, really easily, even if your math skills are fantastic. We see really strong students make mistakes on these all the time, unfortunately. All right, third one, a little bit juicier. I'm actually seeing some errors on this one, which makes me happy, that makes it interesting. So here, the thing I always ask myself on geometry is, hey, what do I know? Like, what, what do I know here? Uh, so I can start doing some stuff, um, so I might know, for example, so these two angles are the same, which means the facing sides must be the same. That's cool. Um, this angle right here, a couple ways to go about this. Some of you might recognize that, so this is 180 minus 2x right here, which means that if you subtract, so 180 minus 180 minus 2x minus x again, I'm running out of space, it's actually going to give you x. Now, those of you who are really, really slick with your geometry rules, you might recognize that that 2x has to be equal to the sum of the opposite two angles. So there's actually a quicker way to identify that that's x. If that's something that doesn't come to mind right away, don't worry about that. My point here is this little act of just kind of pushing through and saying, what else do I know about angles? What else do I know about the sides? It buys you a ton here because now you know not only is this side equal to this side, but now since this is x and this is x, same angle, that means the facing sides must be the same as well. So now you know that AD equals BD equals BC. And now you can translate this question. So asking what's AD, same thing as asking what's BD. Same thing as asking what's BC. And now really, really, really easy to see how statement two by itself is sufficient. And it's efficient. The more energy you put into that question itself, the better off you are. So as you do data sufficiency, um, maybe especially for those of you who are really, really strong at the math, but really for everybody, make sure you're spending that time investing in the question. You cut corners there. It's going to cost you more time. It's going to cost you errors. And again, those careless errors are, are so damaging on this test in inevitability of an adaptive algorithm. Um, next slide, if you could please, Shevik. Um, so. A lot of you, I, I know, I think I said this earlier, um, you know, whenever I say things like this, oh, invest a little more time, spend more time on the question itself, read the question twice, check your work. Um, and people tend to push back on me and say, hey, no, 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 like I, I don't have time for that. I'm, I'm under time pressure. I don't finish the quant section in time. I don't finish the verbal section in time. I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. I, I, I absolutely understand. Nobody can spend, or very, very few people <clears throat> can get through the quant section in particular as comfortably as they'd like. <clears throat> If you're doing your job well, you're going to see harder questions. They're going to take you longer. You're going to need more time. Very, very difficult to comfortably finish 37 questions in 75 minutes if you're seeing questions of the difficulty level you deserve. But here's a quick little illustration. This is a um, enhanced score report from um, one of my students. Um, what I find interesting here, um, and, and he really struggled a lot before I met him. I think he'd studied for about a year and a half before I started working with him. He'd taken the test. I, believe four or five times, maybe six, a ton. I mean, he'd been through a lot. He'd hired two other high-priced tutors. And you saw this kind of erraticness on all of his score reports. So notice here on the, the bottom part of that page, so the first segment, that first quarter of the test, of the quant section, he was averaging about a minute and a half. Yeah, he got eaten alive. 
So he missed, uh, I think, four out of the seven questions or something like that on, on that first quarter of the uh, quant section. And notice what happens to that running difficulty level. So this is a guy with tremendous quant skills, really deserves something like a 48, 49, 50. But notice in that upper graph, flatlined. So he wasn't really seeing questions that were more difficult as he moved from the first section to the second section. He's still seeing the medium stuff or, or barely above medium, nowhere near the high questions that he's actually capable of answering. Again, this is a super, super great quant guy, you know, maybe not going to get a 51, but going to come within a few points of it. Um, and notice that first chunk of the test, he's not making any traction at all. And then he kind of settles in, he starts spending a little bit longer on the questions you know, kind of has a nice, clean, roughly two minutes per question in the last three quarters. But by then, it's really, really, really hard to recover. It's tough once you kind of convince the algorithm, hey, I, I keep missing easy stuff, um, or relatively easy stuff. Again, for him, easy meant medium. Medium questions are easy for him. He got stuck on those medium questions. Yeah, his score went up a little bit. He did okay. He landed in the low 40s, but this is a guy who deserved to be in the high 40s. Really, really clean illustration of somebody who lost kind of in that that five to six point range just from being a little bit too sloppy in the beginning. And we see this kind of thing all the time. You know, we see these graphs on these ESRs that bounce all over the place, or they just aren't going up as quickly as they should. A lot of that is cutting corners in the beginning, or better still, running out of time in the middle and you start cutting corners on things that you know how to do. And those errors are equally damaging. If you miss stuff that you can get right, you're in trouble. Okay, that's enough quant for today. Um, so verbal, let's talk about that a little bit. And we're not going to dive into this uh, this next critical reasoning example just yet. What I'm going to talk about first is, is reading comprehension just a little bit and kind of how in general these same principles are going to apply to verbal. So reading comprehension. Um, I see all sorts of myths out there that um, I find really, really damaging and really disappointing. And a ton of our friends on, on GMAT Club come to us and they say, yeah, I've learned how to skim the passage well probably not going to work. Um, it's going to be really, really tough to skim a passage and understand it well enough to start answering questions. And there's all kinds of gimmicks out there. Oh, I'm going to read the first sentence of every paragraph, then I'm going to skim the rest. Or I'm going to read the first paragraph and the last paragraph and skim in between. Um, or, hey, I'm going to always spend three minutes reading every reading comprehension passage, no matter what. And they sit there and kind of look at the timer and make sure they spend always the same amount of time. Look, this is the this is very very equivalent to what we what I was illustrating on some of those quant questions, some of those easy quant questions, um, where if you miss that one word, Beth's other, or Diana's other votes or whatever, um, or you miss the word positive in there, something that you totally know how to do, you miss it. Same idea is very very much true on the verbal reading comprehension. If you don't have a really clear understanding of how that passage is put together, how it's structured, how it's laid out, what's the author's chain of logic? That's going to make it really, 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 really tough to do well. Um, and just as importantly, you're going to be less efficient if you do that. So if you kind of read through the passage really, really quickly, and then you're going back and forth, and you're cherry picking in the passage, trying to answer the questions as you look at the questions, but you didn't really understand the passage, it's going to take you an eternity. You're going to be back and forth between the passage and the answer choices so much. That's going to be a huge, huge, huge drain on your time. So the, the bottom line on reading comprehension and critical reasoning is, if you don't take the time to understand the passage well, you're going to get yourself into trouble. Now, next week's session, we're going to talk more. We're going to actually go through some examples. It would take us a pretty good chunk of time to go through a reading comprehension passage together right now. We're actually going to do that next week, um, which for some of you will be about as exciting as watching paint dry. Um, for a lot of other people, we've had the request, hey, can you can you show us how to do a reading comprehension passage really, really well? Can you show us what you would do optimally? Can you show us how to be efficient with an actual reading comp passage? We'll actually try to do that next week, along with some critical reasoning, and talk about kind of what are the most common mistakes we see. The most common mistake, I'll spoil part of the surprise right now, is you're not investing enough in that passage, and you think you can get the answers to the questions just by kind of hunting around in the passage for it. It just doesn't work. You're not going to do well on those contextual questions. Again, we'll get into that more next week. But the same principle we're talking about on quant, absolutely true on verbal. Very, very much the same. Um, we will go through one critical reasoning passage pretty quickly here. Um, it's just one of my favorite examples. This is actually an LSAT question um, adjusted a little bit. Um, it was one of my favorites because it, I, I think it. Um, if you're not being really faithful and literal to what's being said in the passage, you're going to get yourself into trouble. If you're just reading nice and literally and calmly, you'll be fine on this. The answer shouldn't be too hard for you. But if you cut corners just a little bit, this one will eat you for breakfast. So I'll give you a couple minutes, and uh, then we'll come back and talk about it.
Let's be just a few more seconds here. If you think you've gotten to an answer, go ahead and pop it up for us. Uh, if you're in the live audience, curious to see what you guys are coming up with. Okay, good. So, so far it sounds like this is going well for you guys. That makes me happy. Um, so what, what I see a lot on this is that when you kind of read this and you read it quickly, um, and it probably helped a little bit that I've kind of been, been setting you up, be careful, be careful, be careful, invest a little bit of time in the passage. What I get a lot off of this is people read the passage and go, yeah, yeah, yeah okay, robustus. Um, and I'm kind of abbreviating it in the, uh, as I wrote it, the answer choices is AR, uh, erectus, kind of abbreviating as HE. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, robustus uh, has a lower ratio of strontium and calcium than erectus. And then it kind of goes on and talks about the meat and the diet. But it's easy to kind of process that as like, oh, yeah, the, the diet contains more strontium to calcium, so more strontium to calcium in the bones or something like that. But the thing is that what exactly is it saying? So it's saying, okay, so Robustus had a lower ratio of strontium to calcium. And we know that a lower ratio of strontium to calcium means that, that you ate more meat just more meat. The only connection we have here between the ratio of strontium and calcium in the bones is the meat in the diet. Nothing about the strontium and calcium in the diet. Just the meat in the diet affects the strontium and calcium ratio in the bones. Um, and we know that erectus ate some meat. So what can we actually conclude from this? What's actually true? Statements above most strongly support which of the following, basically asking us which one of these could be true or, or should be true. Well, meat in the diet of Homo erectus was higher in strontium than the meat in the diet of other hominids. No, the amount of strontium in the diet has nothing to do with the strontium and calcium in the bones. It's just quantity of meat. And it's really easy to look at this and go, yeah, it's kind of the right words. Just rearrange a little funny. You cut a corner there, you might pick A. I think a few people have. B, the diet of uh, AR of uh, Robustus had some meat. Yeah, is that reasonable? Well, if Erectus ate meat and Robustus had a lower ratio of strontium and calcium, which meant more meat, so Robustus must have eaten more meat than Erectus. Erectus ate meat, so Robustus must have eaten meat as well. Should have been more meat, but it just says some meat. Yeah, that's fine. That's got to be true. And then C, D, and E, all kind of this, well, certainly C and D, kind of the same feature. Diet of Homo erectus was richer in calcium than the diet of Robustus. No, we know nothing about whether the eating calcium, eating strontium, having calcium and strontium in the diet, we have no idea if that relates at all to the strontium and calcium in the bones. C is out. Same idea in D. We really don't care about the contents of strontium and calcium in the diet. Just the meat in the diet affects the strontium and calcium in the bones. E, process of fossilization altered the ratio of strontium and calcium in the bones of both of them. I don't think anybody's really tempted by that one. That's kind of what we call the test writer has to come up with a fifth answer choice, did the best they could, not even tempting, and you're left with B. Um, so what, what ends up happening, and you've heard us talk about this, a lot of our first series of videos, um, you know, we did two or three videos on critical reasoning, and we talk quite a bit about this idea that um, what is it really about? It's about making sure that your reading is precise. You're not missing those little details. Um, what ends up happening a lot of the time in the test prep world, and we see this all the time from, from GMAT club members, this emphasis on, oh, this question type, that question type, oh, the logic underneath this question or that question. Cool. Being good at logic is super valuable. It's important. But the most common errors we see are errors of misreading, especially once we put you under time pressure on verbal. As soon as we say, hey, do this faster, do this faster. If I stare at you while you're doing it, you're going to misread something. You're going to decide that uh, this is talking about the strontium in the diet in the passage, not the amount of meat in the diet. Those are the easiest mistakes to make. Can't emphasize it enough. One of the things we talked about in last week's webinar, we talked about this idea that what you always want to do if you're self-studying is don't go jumping around into the explanations in the back of the book. There's a place for that. Um, but don't do that right away. What I want you to do first, take a couple days, let yourself forget about the question, wash your brains a little bit. This goes especially for verbal, but quant as well. Take a day or two, forget about the question, and then go back through with a totally fresh mind. See if you can redo those questions completely from scratch and see what happens. What I'm really, really interested in is when you miss a question the first time, but you get it right the second, what happened? most of the time on critical reasoning and reading comprehension and possibly even sentence correction as well, what's happening? When you go and you redo that question one more time, 
this time you read it just a little bit more carefully. You caught that one word, or you caught that spot where you misread it. You caught that spot where you decided this was talking about strontium in the diet and not meat in the diet. That's the way to kind of get yourself to see those errors. Make sure you're redoing your mistakes a day or two or a few days after your initial attempt at it and really focus on the ones you get right the second time. Everybody gets annihilated by hard questions sometimes. That's normal. Doesn't matter who you are. That's going to happen sometimes. Yes, work to get better at those. Work to get better at your reading. But the first things first on an adaptive test, you can't afford to miss easy stuff, easy for you. First thing I want from you, make sure that you go and you figure out, hey, if I got it right the second time, that means I probably should have gotten it right the first time. Why? Where was the moment where I cut a corner, misread something that caused me to miss something I should have had? All right. Very, very quickly, let's rifle through one sentence correction question before our hour's up. Um, and for those of you who watched our first series from last fall, most of it was about sentence correction. Um, we kind of took these little subtopics and talked about stuff. We'll do two webinars on sentence correction later on this spring. Um, this is just a quick one. And let me see what you guys come up with on this. Um, and we'll come back and I'll kind of talk a little bit about how sort of this idea of cutting corners can hurt you on sentence correction as well. I'll give you about a minute or two. Okay, we'll give you just a couple more seconds. If you've already come up with an answer, go ahead and, go ahead and spit it out. I'm just curious to see if you guys are nailing this or having some trouble. And yes, apologies, guys. The underlined portion in the actual question doesn't match A. Ignore what's underlined in that actual sentence for now um, and just treat A like the original sentence. Sorry about that.
Okay, so let's move on ahead and kind of, I don't know if you guys are nailing this or not, or if that error caused confusion again, sorry about that. And for those of you who haven't seen one of these before, we're live, so you get to see all my mistakes um, and they'll be on YouTube for eternity, fantastic. All right, um, here's my instinct on this, first time I saw this, um, as I would go, yeah, yeah. So visitors have often looked up into the leafy canopy and seen monkeys sleeping on the branches. I think that sounds awful. I really do. Visitors have seen, have, visitors have looked up at the leafy canopy. Visitors seen monkeys sleeping on branches. It just doesn't sound right at all. It really seems like you should say saw there. Visitors have looked up and saw monkeys. Honestly, that's kind of how we would say it. I think most Americans at least would say it that way. Um, that's actually wrong. See, D and E are all wrong. Why? Visitors have often looked up. We did a video last year on parallelism and meaning and I don't want to rehash the whole thing here. Um, you see the word and, just always think, okay, what follows that and? What comes immediately after the and? It's either saw or seen, that's a verb. You want to know, okay, what is that parallel to? Well, it's got to be looked, right? So visitors have often looked up, visitors have often seen. You want that form of the verb that goes with have, you want that participle there. So visitors have often looked up and seen. Your answer's got to be A or B right there. And then, I, th I don't think any of you are going to be tempted by B. The big mistake here is obviously that noun modifier, whose. So visitors have often looked up in a leafy canopy and seen monkeys sleeping on the branches whose arms and legs have hung like socks on a clothesline. Well, it looks like whose is trying to modify the branches. Branches don't have arms and legs that hang like socks on a clothesline. Doesn't make sense. Makes a whole lot more sense to say, seen monkeys sleeping. Monkeys are sleeping with their legs hanging like socks on a clothesline. Good job, monkeys. So right there, your answer is A. I think most of you guys got that. And again, apologies for the typo in, that, uh, in the question itself. Um, what's my point though? So talking about this idea of cutting corners, the biggest corner we see people cutting on sentence correction is just going off of ear right away and going off of instinct and being really, really hasty to eliminate something, especially if it's based on a split. It's really tempting to go, ah, this this split sounds better. I, I like C, D, E, it sounds better than A and B. Yeah, fair enough, that's my instinct as well, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, back home, people would say saw here, it's wrong. <laughs> but that's what we would say. Um, and in reality, if you're actually taking that extra moment to say, let me think through that parallelism carefully, there's an and, what comes after it? Better be parallel with looked, have looked, have seen, that's the correct form. And then from there, no problem at all. So this is just my friendly reminder. Your ear is never your friend on sentence correction. If you get too hasty and you start going, oh yeah, yeah, yeah this one sounds better. You're gonna run right into those traps. Very much equivalent to the things we were talking about on the other question types. It's equivalent in some ways. Skimming on sentence correction will cause the same damage as skimming on critical reasoning, as skimming on reading comp, as skimming on data sufficiency, as skimming on problem solving. And the most important thing, I know, not sexy, all I've really done is nag you for an hour here today, is make sure you're being really disciplined. Read that question twice on your quant, Every single time, data sufficiency or problem solving, check your work as you go. When you're done, read one more time. You can't afford not to spend the time. You make some easy errors, the wheels come off. You'll be one of those stories we don't like to read. Be disciplined every single time. Don't waste your time on quant on the ones that are over your head. Invest that time that you save, being really, really careful and methodical. It doesn't take you that much more time it'll actually make you a little bit more efficient. Data sufficiency, make sure that you're pushing that question as far as it'll go. Once again, it's an investment of your time that I promise will make you more efficient. It's actually gonna save you time. It's definitely gonna save you errors. Critical reasoning, reading comp, sentence correction. I get all sorts of things out there that, that people say, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna speed up on certain kinds of questions. I'm gonna save time. I'm gonna catch up on certain kinds of verbal questions. Folks, it just doesn't work. If you don't understand that passage as clearly as, as you can, or as clearly as is necessary, critical reasoning, reading comp, before you move on, it just isn't gonna go for it, go well for you. No gimmicks, no shortcuts, you just have to get through that passage as best you can, understand as much as you can. If you try to save 20 seconds, wheels are gonna come off. Again, two or three careless errors, you're in trouble. Can't say it often enough. All right, that wraps it up for today. Um, what we're gonna do next week, so February 28th, I believe, Wednesday, same time, same time, um, 
what we're going to do is we're going to talk about reading comprehension critical reasoning exclusively. Um, and we're going to focus quite a bit on what are the things that are most likely to lead you to errors. And we'll talk about kind of what optimal technique looks like, especially on reading comprehension. We've had some other critical reasoning videos. You have a sense of how we want you to think about that. This is going to be our first attempt at live reading comprehension next week. Maybe not the most exciting thing to watch, especially if it's a passage that you find easy. I'll try to choose it really, really carefully to illustrate how best to approach them. So we'll do that. Also talk about just kind of the most common pitfalls, common mistakes we see on reading comprehension, critical reasoning. Um, and before you go today, make sure you subscribe to the GMAT Club YouTube page. We're beefing up the content, more GMAT, more MBA application videos, a um, whole bunch coming up soon. We're going to be uh, doing more work interviewing admissions people, both on the consulting side and also from schools themselves. So subscribe to our page and uh, we will see you next week. We've got six more weeks of these GMAT videos. We'll be here same time every Wednesday, 930 Pacific. All right. Thank you so much, everybody, and happy studying.